Municipal governments are local elected authorities. They include cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. In the political trenches, local government at work, we dive into the top issues facing local governments across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, the host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I am joined by my co-host, Ian McCormick, President of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Today, we bring you the letter D, which stands for Down Under. Later on in the episode, we'll be speaking with Australian local government consultant and podcast host, Chris Eddy, who is the host of the Local Government News Roundup podcast. We'll also be talking about what happens when council and administration's disagreements spills over into the courts, the cost of downloading and offloading from provincial governments and the federal governments, and also we'll be talking about the needs to start addressing houselessness. Ian, how's it been? Hey, you're pretty good there, Chris. Uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, on to D, hey, that's four four episodes already. Four episodes in, and we're go we're talking about we're going to be talking a little bit later with Chris Eddy, friend of you, uh, now friend of me, and I'm looking forward to it. But let's start off with some big news. And this comes out of Regina. Uh, a city council, two city councillors in Regina have put forward a motion to address homelessness. And it has led to a filing of a lawsuit against the current city manager who started in November. The councillors are accusing the CAO of failing to adhere to council's directives. The lawsuit is asking the courts to direct the new Regina CAO to include an estimated $24.9 million in the upcoming budget to end homelessness in Saskatchewan's capital, Regina. Ian, this does not look good, does it? This is bizarre, Chris. This is something that... Uh... Well, it's not unheard of for elected officials to uh, to to sue. Really, to me, this yeah, it's, it has. It, it, as an example, uh, there was a case. It's part of a municipal review that was done in the town of Fort McLeod in Alberta, where uh, the, the the mayor had was sanctioned by council and uh, disagreed with that, and so sued council. So I don't think it's great team building to sue your own council, but uh, the mayor, the then mayor, did it and. Uh, it did, in fact, get before the courts, and the, the judge ruled in counsel's favor to say that uh, it was legitimate. The, the sanctions that were applied against the mayor in that case were legitimate. And I don't recall what happened following that. However, I do know that that mayor remained sanctioned for most of most, if not all, of that term. It would be the 2017 to 2021 term. He did a he did run for re-election in the next election and got about five percent of the vote as the incumbent mayor. So. So it does happen. Uh, that's an Alberta example. But the one you're referencing is in Regina. And when I read this, it, I had a couple of people send send notes to me talking about what the heck is this all about? And it's it's most peculiar because to me, there are two things that two things at play here. One, you you made a reference to this story itself, and it's about a, a, a member of council who is a lawyer filing a suit on behalf of another councillor and somebody who isn't a member of council, a social activist within town. Uh, saying that it was the CAO, well, administration through the office of the CAO, said that they did not put a council request by a budget line into the budget to do to deal with homelessness. It was a significant proportion of the city budget and would have raised the taxes for people like something to do with $40 a month or something to that effect. But the point being that they alleged that the unelected administration took over the role of the this subverted the role of those who were democratically elected. So to me, there are kind of two issues at play here. The, fir the first one is about the will of council. Council did, uh, to my knowledge anyway, from what I've read, passed a motion that said we need, we ought to have, or we should have some idea of what ending homelessness in Regina would cost. But you've hired, you as council have hired experts. And if you aren't gonna pay attention to your experts and you're gonna do it all yourself, there's a role clarity issue there too. And under, I understand, again, from the news item that the, the CAO administration chose not to put that into the budget package because of the, the impact on the uh, the taxpayer at the end of the day. The counter to that was, well, let, let, let the elected officials make that determination, which kind of gets to the second point, and that's gotcha. That if that if that issue was included in the budget, people who wanted to take it out would essentially be perceived as having to vote against ending homelessness in Regina. 
So there's certainly nuance to this. I don't know what's going on below the tip of the iceberg, but to me, it's trying to make a point out of council. It's trying to make a point. And the rest of council didn't actually challenge, to my understanding, the rest of council didn't challenge this removal. And therefore, the removal could conceivably consider to be a council decision, too. So it's something that is unusual, not unprecedented, but also not good governance. Keeping in the realm of houselessness and homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, municipalities like Edmonton in Alberta, Nanaimo in BC are starting to look at the increase in houselessness in their communities. In the former municipality I used to work with, they are starting to address houselessness and are municipalities needing to focus in 2023, particularly in this budget, on more social issues yeah, well, there's a chapter in my first book called It's Never About What It's About. <laughs> and when it comes to homelessness, houselessness, uh, hidden homelessness, all those sorts of things, that's often a symptom of something else. And if without addressing the symptom, the car, the problem is not going to go away, going away anyway. So, uh, provision of homes for people really isn't, well, it isn't a municipal responsibility. Uh, there are social organizations, there are federal and provincial funding for this or territorial funding for this as well. And however, when push comes to shove and everything trickles down, it's ultimately the municipalities that need to deal with it. It's, uh, it's not uncommon. In fact, I think it's probably most municipalities, most urban municipalities and a lot of the rural ones face this issue to various ways as well. Some of it is visible and some of it is not. We've heard from municipalities like Victoria, for example, you made, made a reference of Edmonton and Calgary and others too, where things like tent cities pop up. And that highlights the visibility of something that is deeper than that. So we're seeing this as the, I, I think anyway, what we're seeing is the effect of growing cutbacks on the prevention end of things. So not having a home is often is not a choice of a person. Some people, perhaps it is, I, I don't know, but for most people, it's because of things like, uh, social disorder or mental health issues, lack of education, lack of social support. So those are the sorts of things that make people trickle down to the point where they end up literally or figuratively on the street, on the streets. And that then does become a local government thing because it happens in local government geographical areas. To me, this is around short-sightedness, um, whether you want to call it libertarianism or whether you want to call it populism or something to that. If, if you're not thinking further ahead, you're really not governing. And by addressing just the symptoms, things get worse in the long term. I will say, though, that because we typically just have four and five year terms for our governments, it passes the cost of the problem on to somebody else later. So any increase in, in, in revenue that's required isn't my fault anymore. It's now the next government that has addressed it. And I, I did think it was interesting. You made a reference to Nanaimo. They have something called a health and housing action plan. So they have conflated that health piece and the housing piece, the housing being an outcome potentially or a symptom of health related issues and tied those two together. And I think a lot of places have done that. And so to me, we're not going to get ahead of homelessness, houselessness until we back that up and try and figure out where the problems actually lie. And not only that, it's going to take some time to fix it because it, the, the downstream effects are are in, in in the running already for years and years to come before we even address the problems up, up at the top of the head, stream, head of stream. In my previous career as a journalist and even as the uh, communications for a small municipality in Northern Alberta, I know that uh, issues around social issues when it comes to council are always hard to tackle, particularly houselessness and homelessness. And the reason that is, is because where do you put them? Where do you put a place for people to go? No one wants it in their backyard. So to, to sort of put you in a tough spot here, uh, Ian, how do councils deal with that scenario, the nimbyism of the entire yeah. issue? Because I know like there's a small community up in Northern Alberta right now who I've been following and they want to erect a hospice in their community, but no one wants it in their area. So how do you address issues when no one wants to have it in their backyard? And not only that, then the default becomes, well, put it where nobody votes. So it ends up in a commercial area or an industrial area. And that doesn't solve your problem either. I, I had the opportunity to sit in a mayor's office not so long ago, a couple of years ago, at third or fourth floor of City Hall. 
look out his window and there's the, the tent city right outside city hall. So, I mean, that doesn't really answer your question about where do you put it, but. But does council yeah, not have an obligation to make the tough decisions and not they, care about the nimbyism? That's where I was going to go with this is, and I, I probably said this before, but if all the decisions were easy, only one member of council actually happens, has to be there. But in this case, there you're hoping that the council has a breadth of political affiliate. Well, not like small p political uh, per, per philosophy. You're hoping that they've got uh, length of tenure in their communities and experience elsewhere. Elsewhere. So at some point, if you, you have to address the issue now as well as looking to prevent future issues as well. So we've seen policing agencies been involved either in maintaining order in these places, or we have seen policing agencies partaking in removing these. And they'll just pop up somewhere else without, without sound planning on behalf of local governments. And we're seeing ancillary problems uh, as well as outbreaks of various types of bacterial or, or, or um, uh, virus, viral problems coming too. So the homelessness begets other social issues as well, as well as having been caused by other social issues. So it certainly is a wicked problem. Offloading, downloading from provincial and federal governments is common right now. We have the mayor of Canmore, a town in Alberta, that we have the mayor of Panoka saying that the ongoing downloading from the provincial government and or offloading, however you want to call it, um, and scaling back of grants that municipalities can apply for is putting them in a tough spot this budget session because it's happening while they're in the midst of budget negotiations. I'm a big proponent of things like priority-based budgeting where you have a pretty good understanding of everything the municipality does and you're able to rank it. If there's no money left, we, we, the things that are the, providing the lowest value, and it might be different this year than last year, the things that where there is no money left kind of fall off the list or go into abeyance until the time when they become higher priority. So that simplistically is a way to deal with that from a purely financial sense. You made a reference to Canmore and, and likely elsewhere as well, where, and you made, you talked to Pinocchio, but specifically to Canmore, the CBC said, and I quote, the mayor of Canmore says his town is spending about $3.2 million or about 10% of the town's annual budget on costs the provincial government should be responsible for. Now, what the mayor was referencing here was given the location of Canmore in mountain park areas and certainly close to wilderness areas, things like uh, emergency response or search and rescue and the training associated with people who do that, wildlife management and some policing too, outside the geographical boundaries of the town aren't really the town's responsibility, but they're being called out to assist with that. So I think that that's the case that the mayor is making that we are using town resources to help out in surrounding uh, rural areas or wilderness areas, which they kind of have to do, but saying we're not able to recoup those costs from the provincial government or any other agency too, for that matter. So that what's happening is even without doing so with intention, there's a download of responsibility without a downloading of associated authority or downloading of resources to go with that. I mean, if there was an extra $3.2 million, say, provided to the town to provide that search and rescue or uh, the that sort of thing, then there the may be less of an issue. But the responsibilities, if the province, if the federal government stops and the province stops, there's, and the municipality stops eventually, that means whatever it is no longer gets, gets uh, offered. And so that means eventually that if it stops, that the local government is going to bear the brunt of any criticism that cover, comes. So while the cause may be coming from another order of government, the effect is happening with the local government and shielding those who are actually ultimately responsible for this. It's, it's a case of not seeing various orders of government all on the same team, all pulling together, all representing the same person. It's, you can talk about one, there's only one taxpayer as well, but that taxpayer provides their dollar to the province or to the, to the federal government when in reality, it's getting spent at the local level. One, the one, the one dollar is raised in one place and spent in another, and that is inequitable just at its core. We'll be right back with our guest of today's show, Chris Eddy, a Australian local government consultant and local government podcast host. You know, it's going to be really interesting, Chris, just to see how similar and how different some of the topics we've just talked about are in Australia, and we'll have to put some of these questions to him too. Let's see it. Uh, 
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to D is for Down Under. And it's our uh, privilege today to have Chris Eddy join us. Chris is uh, heavily involved in local government in Australia. Uh, Chris and I have worked together on and off for the last couple of years on a variety of different topics. Chris is a former CEO in Australia. And in Australia, that is the equivalent to our CAOs. They are known as chief executive officers, whereas we call them chief administrative officers. He's also the administrator of the city of Whittlesey in Victoria, the co-host of the VLGA Connect podcast, and VLGA is the Victorian Local Governance Association. He hosts the Local Government News Roundup podcast and has a ton of local government experience. We're really interested in talking to you, Chris, about some of the differences between local government in Canada and in Australia. Thank you. Hello, Ian. Nice to see you again. And Chris, nice to meet you. Nice to meet hey. you as well, Chris. Well, why don't we just get started then? Um, you uh, you had talked about uh, just behind the scenes while we were doing a bit of a debriefing about uh, the differences between the role of CEO slash CAO and administrator. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. So I was a CEO for for a while and involved in local government at the executive level for, for more than 20 years. Uh, I am now what's known as a um, an administrator at a council that was dismissed by the government for governance failing. So there's, there's only a handful of these roles at any given time in the state of Victoria, and I'm one of a panel of three. We have a chair administrator and two other administrators, of which I'm one. And we have all the same responsibilities, powers, uh, duties as elected councillors, but there's only three of us, whereas ordinarily there'd be 11 elected councillors. So until the next election, which is scheduled for October 2024, um, we are uh, in place as a panel to do the job of the council and basically restore uh, governance and confidence with the community. Nice. So there would there wouldn't be a, a by election in between. Then you're there for the duration of the term. Yeah. So the government, in its wisdom, uh, chose to make the decision to remove the council just before the last round of elections. So in a, in effect, the and and I didn't come in right at the start. The administrators are in place for probably four and a half years by the time the election happens, which is actually a bit shorter than we've seen with some other councils in the past where we had one in particular that had administrators for seven years before it returned to elected wow. councillors. So you obviously have a passion for local government. How did you end up in that particular seat in the first place? I do have a passion for local government. For my for my sins, uh, I do a few different <laughs> things around uh, the sector at the moment. My background was media, Ian and Chris, uh, radio and television in uh, in the regional parts of Victoria. And I got to I was a little bit of a square peg in a round hole uh, doing interviews and talkback radio on what was primarily a music station. But I got to know the local leaders, the, the, the council CEO, the local politicians, etc., and started to get this understanding and interest in uh, local government in particular. Uh, and I went from there into a communications role in the local council. This is back at uh, Greater Shepparton in uh, the year 2000. And from there, I realised the opportunity and the career path that exists in local government and got into management roles, managed a whole range of different functions within local government, ultimately becoming a council CEO in uh, a municipality known as Hobson's Bay, which is a metropolitan council in the greater Melbourne area. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here with a, sort of a, a question about Australia's uh, local governments, because here yes. in Canada, we are seeing a big changeover with a lot. And that was an episode we did recently with B being big changes. And I'm just wondering, uh, as Australia is currently going through some local changes right now, local government elections with new mayors some by uh, uh, deputy mayors, are you seeing the changes like we are seeing here in Canada or is it the stability that uh, Australia is looking for right now? Because I know federally they just did change over governments. Are they doing that locally as well? Uh, yes, we, we're seeing quite a bit of change. Uh, whether there's as much of it happening at the local level is arguable. But as we speak, we are. it is election day in the state of Victoria. And, um, you know, you 
there's all the polls are suggesting different sort of outcomes, but we're seeing this rise of independence. And what I am seeing, yeah. uh, Chris, to get to your question, is a lot more local councillors throwing their hat in the ring for a higher level of of, of public office. So we've got a lot of councillors in Victoria that are running for uh, for election today at the state level. Um, some of them are given a good chance, uh, which of course is going to trigger a whole range of countbacks and by elections if they do at their uh, at their individual councils. But I know you've been curiously following my updates about the mayoral elections, because we're right also in the middle of the mayoral election cycle in Victoria, which is a bit curious because other states have moved more towards a direct directly uh, elected mayoral model, uh, not holus bolus, but um, um, certainly more than they have in Victoria. We only have two councils that have the, the, the people elect the mayor. The rest of them are elected by their colleague councillors, and, and, and they can appoint a mayor for up to two years. But what tends to happen is that they get appointed for 12 months. So we get this electoral, this election cycle every 12 months. And uh, we are seeing quite a bit of change. We're seeing a lot of new mayors stepping up for the first time. And I've been tracking the gender balance because a lot of people are really keen to see this be addressed more so this time around. And we're sitting at about 55, 45 as of today, at male, female, in terms of um, mayors holding office, which is a slight improvement, but there's eight still to come in this particular cycle. So that's where we're seeing some change, I think. We're also seeing a lot of uh, issues that aren't particularly seen as local government issues bubbling up into the arena of council decisions, um, the intersection of uh, state politics with local politics such as you know greens uh we've got a, a very strong getting stronger greens party here which are pushing a lot of sustainability and climate change sort of activity and we're seeing that reflected around the local council chamber as well more so i think than we've seen um at any time in the past you know the fascinating thing here chris is that we evolve from the same root uh British, True. and it, it's yes. uh we've all evolved in quite different fashions I, in speaking with now former mayor uh, Kim O'Keefe from Greater Shepparton, she was suggested. She told me uh, uh, about the role of local government being roads, rates, and rubbish, which wasn't a term that I had heard before. But what is the scope of local government? I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to say it depends on the state you're in. Um, roads, rates, and rubbish is a common theme that comes up, and generally, uh, I don't want to tar people with a with a rash generalisation, but it's that older generation that thinks councils should stick to their knitting, basically, and just do roads, rates, and rubbish. They shouldn't be involved in climate change and LGBTIQ inclusive programs and all, all these sorts of things that we now see local government being a part of. I did an exercise once back when I was CEO at Hobson's Bay uh, with the councillors who were really keen to try and build an understanding in the community of just what their council did. Act what, what does your council actually do? We worked out that we delivered 130 distinct different services to the community. So we embarked on this. So we, we sort of grouped them together into 100 and did a campaign called 100 Services in 100 Days, which really worked at that time with that community to build an awareness of all of these things that your council does for you that you might not realise it's actually being delivered by the council, by your local government. And just try, if you've ever been at the executive level of a council uh, or even a council or just try and take away any one of those hundred <laughs> services and see how hard it is. See what happens. Yeah. Sure. Well, any addition or change or removal is a political decision because it was obviously put there for the first place. Yeah, so absolutely. in your role too, though, as the person who's looking after the shop 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, are there any requirements for education or certification for CEOs or administrators? Uh, no, it's really professional experience uh, and um, I guess being able to demonstrate the knowledge and capacity to do that position. You're not going to see someone appointed to a CEO position, for example, without the right track record 
and without the right qualifications to support that. It's mm-hmm. very different at the councillor level, of course, because you can run to be elected for council with 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 no relevant qualifications whatsoever. Uh, and that, of course, happens. People successfully yeah. find themselves sitting around the council table, not really, this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, not really that well equipped to deal with the decisions that they're being asked to make. And that can be a very steep learning curve for some people. You, you made a reference earlier uh, to keeping track of gender balance in council. Mm. Are you seeing any differences uh, generationally or uh, gender based on CEOs as well? Uh, yeah, we do try and track both. Uh, and I do a regular exercise to to keep track of the the, the appointments at the CEO level in uh, in the state of Victoria. Um, it's much lower, the gender mix at the CEO level. It's about uh, 70-30 men and women as i said before the count at the councillor level or the mayor level it's uh, it's getting towards parity which is starting to reflect the uh the increasing number of women and there's been strong campaigns and a lot of effort put into encouraging more women to stand mm-hmm. for council the counter to that is the cultural issue which you know i've been reading stuff that's coming out of canada i don't think it's any different to what we're dealing with here in terms of behavior around the council table, which is an impediment, I think, to a lot of people, but women in particular, to actually wanting to put their hand up to be part of that dynamic. We haven't solved that problem. A lot of very bright minds are putting their uh, their efforts into trying to solve um, that problem. Every state, I think, is putting significant effort into addressing the the gender issue, at the local government level, uh, particularly at the elected level, and looking at how to reduce those barriers that are stopping more women from actually putting their hand up in the first place. I think the recent Tasmanian local government elections saw something like uh, 29%, um, I hope I'm not misquoting that, of candidates were were women, um, but the number of ultimately elected mayors was much higher, closer to 50%. So that's sending... Some interesting signals. Uh, something you said a little bit earlier about downloading of state issues onto local governments. We Here in uh, Alberta, we are seeing that a lot. We actually just mm. talked about it in our first segment where we're seeing the provincial government sort of asking the local governments to pick up a lot of the slack. In Australia, mm. is there being pushback from local government saying, no, 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 we're not going to do that? Because we're seeing here in Alberta, particularly, where local governments are talking to their newspapers and saying, enough's enough. We can't budget on a downloading experience that the province is doing. Is it happening locally and statewide in Australia? Yes, it is. I think it's a pretty common theme across the country. And as you've said, in Canada, and I know it's an issue in the UK, um, and added adding to that complexity, where um, local government is a creature of the state, uh, in pretty much all of the states of, of Australia. We exist by virtue of state legislation. A lot of uh, requirement and prescription gets imposed on local government from the state level. At the same time, there's some form of rate capping in place in most states, and there certainly is in Victoria, with the state uh, limiting the amount of money that uh, councils can raise from rates, and that's you know feeding into the cost of living issue at the moment. So councils are constantly and um, needing to come up with better ways to get their message across there that it's it's hard enough to do what we need to do now without having more responsibilities. Uh, or more prescription or more complexity placed on the role that uh, that local government has. So I don't think we're any different there, Chris. If you turn the focus ahead a little bit, what, are there any significant changes you see or predict coming to how local government operates in Victoria or more broadly? And the second part to that is, if you could change something, if you uh, had your magic wand, what would you change? Let's deal with the first one uh, first. What do I see coming down the future? I, I, I'd like to see um, a little less of the added complexity that we were talking about being placed on the sector so that the sector can actually uh, get on and do what it needs to do without some of those shackles. We've seen in Victoria a new piece of legislation which has gone some of the way towards that. It's uh, principles-based rather than being prescriptive, as the mm-hmm. previous piece of legislation was. So I think that's a good step to the future. I think uh, I think we will see more people, more younger people, more women 
getting involved because all of those efforts will pay off. They're already starting to pay off. And I think that's a good thing for local representation. Um, this might be a bit controversial, but I, I think we're nearly at that point in the cycle where someone's going to start a conversation about whether, particularly in Victoria, whether 79 councils is too many and whether there needs to be some sort of structural change, uh, keeping in mind that 30 years ago we went from 210 down to 79 ultimately. Um, and, and that's not to say that uh, it would definitely contract. It could be, there could be a strong counter argument that actually 79 is not enough and that local level of representation is is missing out. So I think that's a conversation that will happen. Uh, what would I change, uh, Ian? That's a really tough one. Um, I think I'd try and make some changes that... Um, allow CEOs to operate a little bit more independently of the political sphere. CEOs, in my view, get too much dragged into the politics, um, and uh, that's just the way the system the system works. They need some more independence. And uh, I had another brilliant thought, and it's just gone. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's really hard to say what you would uh, what you would change. I think I, I know what it was. I think I would seriously look at this practice of mayors being elected on a twelve monthly basis, because generally, what tends to happen is it gets shared around based on whose turn it is, rather than uh, who is best suited to right. actually do that role and deliver for the community. Some councils are very mature and they actually think of it that way. Um, others haven't quite gotten there yet. That's that's my take on mature. Someone will probably challenge me on that. Mm -hmm. But but I, I think that's something that needs, there needs to be a discussion about at least. Sure. Interestingly, uh, I think we're seeing very much the same when you talk about uh, needing to reduce the number of local government, uh, not local governments or institutions where that has begun to happen here and there are conversations in other parts of the country about that as well. And mm. in terms of the CEO or CAO stepping back from uh, being political, I think most, if not all people who occupy that office would certainly appreciate that here as well. So thank you. Mm. And uh, just thank you very much also, just as we wrap up for to Chris Eddy for joining us today. And uh, it's fascinating to hear some of the similarities and some of the differences about your experience and what we are seeing as well. And uh, it's more things change, the more they seem to say the same. So, Chris, thank <laughs> exactly you so much right. for joining us. <laughs> thank you. It's been a pleasure. Nice to meet you both and all the best with the show. Ian, uh, great interview with Chris Eddy. Great topics that we started off the show with. It seems like there's always something happening locally. Yeah, it's funny. Nationally, we hear local things going on all the time. And you're right. To, and that conversation with Chris was a lot of fun. I've had a chance to work with him on and off the last couple of years. And he's always a very insightful guy. And I really enjoy him as well. Um, so for those who are listening and watching this, if you want to listen to Chris's podcasts, they will be linked in the show notes. So if you're watching this via YouTube, scroll down. They're there. If you're listening to this via all the uh, podcast channels, go back and you can check them out. Highly recommend them. If you want a local government angle from Australia, he he always seems to bring the good. So check it out. Um, but Ian, we I, I, I always say this at the end, but I'm going to keep on saying this. Reach out. For those who are watching right now, send us your feedback about the show because we really want to hear from you about what you like, what you don't like, how we can talk about things that are happening in your community. Reach out because it helps us continue making great content for you to listen to. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. So with that, we will be back in two weeks time for our last episode of the Political Trenches Local Government at Work for 2022. Wow. Uh, we'll be right. So talk to you soon, guys.